You are braver than you believe, you are smarter than you seem, and stronger than you think. Don't be afraid to be amazing. It is for you to learn the skill of leadership. And leadership in the 21st century is actually a very different skill than was adopted and cultivated in the 20th century. And if you don't change and you don't adapt and you don't evolve, your ability to become a senior vice president or a circle of champion in this organization will be very, very limited. Learn this skill and you can rise faster than you ever imagined possible. So what I want to do is tell you as publisher of Success Magazine, we are constantly purveying the landscape, trying to look out ahead for you to figure out where the economy, where the marketplace, where the opportunities are out in front of us, because our job is to empower and equip entrepreneurs with the resources, tools, insight, and information they need to go out and build successful organizations and create abundant prosperity-based lives. So as we look out over the horizon of the 21st century, I have both good news and bad news. So we are constantly surrounded with the negative information of how the economy is bad, how our government systems are corrupt, how gossip and scandal is pervading every area of our culture and society. And the reality is, is that a lot of these are statistically true, because here's what's happening to many families out there in today's economy. We have a 7.8% unemployment rate, and if you calculate those the way that they did during the Depression era, the statistics are similar to what it was during the Depression. That means that 12.3 million families right now are without an income, without a way to support themselves financially. Now, if you dig a little deeper into these statistics, long-term unemployment, that means that people who've been without an income for 27 months, over two years, without a financial income to support their family, means that these people are desperate. There's 4.7 million families just in the United States in that condition. Looking a little deeper here, this also means that there are 2.4 what are called marginally attached. They don't put those in the actual unemployment statistic because these people wanted a job and they looked in the past 12 months, but they haven't looked in the last four weeks, so they don't really want a job. Let's not put them in the unemployment statistic. 2.4 million families have become so discouraged they haven't looked in the last month. Then you add on top of that those that are so discouraged with the economic horizon for their family that they're not even looking for a job at all. There's 804,000 families in that position. A little bit further, this doesn't even include the underemployment. That means that these are people who once had full-time jobs to support their families, now can only find part-time work. And as a result, they are underfunding their families' needs. There's 8 million families in that position right now. And here's what most people don't know. Those jobs are not coming back. The jobs that they were laid off from, those same jobs, those same positions, those same technical skills, academic training, those jobs in particular are not coming back because those companies have figured out how to do more with less. They've outsourced overseas and they've rehired their employees as contract workers to avoid a lot of the other government issues going on with healthcare and the rest of it. So that's the bad news. But there's good news, and there's very, very good news given what's happening economically. Let's take a look at the good news. See, it, it's difficult sometimes to see the good news through the bad news because when these big corporate structures start failing and you see the industrial age starting to crumble, it, it looks bad. I mean, those economic statistics look and are bad, but it's just like when the dinosaurs started to die out. When they all became extinct, these big animals that once roamed the earth are eliminated from the planet. That sounds bad. Well, it's not bad for smaller animals who, with the dinosaurs gone, can now flourish. There are new kings to the kingdom being crowned, and the ones that were once suppressed now end up ruling the jungle. So here's what also is happening within the corporate structure. All these big, large, corporate organizations that are crumbling and unemploying millions and millions of people looks like a bad thing. But it's not a bad thing for the independent 
self-motivated, self-responsible, sole proprietor, the entrepreneur, the individual home-based business. This is when the new kings of the kingdom get crowned. You have never had an opportunity to rise to the top of the economic and societal totem pole at any time in human history than we've got in front of us right now, here today. I mean, 40, 50 years from now, when you've got your great-grandchild bouncing on your knee and they're, they're gonna ask you how all this was possible, you're gonna say, I was there, I was there at the right place at the right time. The industrial age started to crumble and then the new age of the individual sole proprietor, independent business owner emerged and I was right there with the right company, with the right opportunity at the right time. That's how all this was made possible. So we are undergoing and I'm telling you as a person who studies this economically and marketplace wise, one of the greatest economic shifts in all of human history. There's this great redistribution and then expansion of wealth going on right now. I'll give you the statistics. This comes out of Merrill Lynch. Here's the way it's evolved. In the 1900s, there were only 5 million millionaires anywhere worldwide. And then the progression was 50 years later, there was 100,000. 30 years after that, there was a million. 10 years after that, it doubled. And then by year 2000, there were 7 million millionaires worldwide. And then a lot of people thought that they missed their chance because we saw the dot-com bubble, we saw the 9-11 travesty, and if you didn't make your wealth by then, it didn't look like economically it was ever gonna be possible again, except that by 10 to 2010, this had expanded to 10 million millionaires. So here we are, 2013. What does the forecast of the future look like just by 2020? The number of millionaires worldwide is expected to double. That means that, that wealth is expanding, that wealth that was usually contained in the small upper echelon is being redistributed down the line and then wealth is expanding up at the same time as well. So there's never been a time in all of human history to take advantage of the economic and wealth forecast of the future than it is right here at this time. But don't get 20, 30 years down the road and go, if I'd only worked a little harder, if I'd only tried, if I'd only pushed myself, I wouldn't be in the situation that I am right now. I'm telling you, now is the time, like never before, to work, to invest yourself, to grow yourself, to become the leader you're capable of becoming. So it is an unprecedented opportunity for those who acquire the skills. You can't just be at the right place at the right time. You just can't bring your surfboard out into the middle of the ocean and just expect that the waves are going to take you without having to learn how to paddle and learn how to get up and surf. You know, you do that, the waves are just gonna crash you into the rocks. You gotta develop some skills. So let me tell you why leadership is the most important skill, particularly in this era of incredibly expanding change. Even Charles Darwin admitted, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but it will be the one most responsive to change. So I don't care how strong you are or how intelligent you are, it is not going to be the skill you'll need going forward into the future. There are, there are a few certainties in life we know about, right? Death, apparently a lot more taxes, and change. And the reality is, is change is now speeding up like never before. Let me give you the stats on this. There are several shifts causing an acceleration in the speed of change in our society. Technology, knowledge, globalization, and the demographic majority. Technology. This comes out of Raymond Kurzweil's uh, essay, The Law of Accelerating Returns, where he says that in the 21st century, we will not experience a hundred years of change like it has been for the previous centuries. We will experience not 100 years of change, but 20,000 years of change. In other words, 10x the number of change that we've seen in all of calendared history. Then we take a look at knowledge. Statistically, it's known that by 1990, it took 150 years to double all of human knowledge. Today, one to two years. By 2020, all of human knowledge will double every 72 days. Five times a year, all of human knowledge will double. Globalization. 
Competition for talent, resources, attention, and sales are no longer local. You're not competing with the business down the street or the other member of your chamber of commerce. Today, you are competing on a global scale. You can't just learn to be a leader in your community, in your neighborhood, in your state, in your region, in your country. You've got to learn how to be a global leader if you want to take advantage of the economic forecast of the future. And then another huge shift, particularly impacting your ability to lead, is what's happening demographically within the workforce. So, the millennial generation, these are people born in the 80s and 90s, are the largest to enter the workforce in all of recorded human history. Then, there'll be half the workforce in just four years. Half of everybody working will be of a millennial. And when they enter, by 2020, they'll have, they'll have most of the leadership roles within our, organ, within our society. And at then, we'll have five generations. It's never happened. We have five generations all working in the workforce at the same time. This is the reason why the balance and skill of leadership, learning how to lead in these dynamic environments is going to be a critical skill. And then we've also had a new milestone that was passed last year. And that is where we have more women working than men. In fact, the unemployment rate for men was 9.3% last year and it was only 7.6% for women. And the number of stay-at-home dads doubled. That means that one out of every... The stay-at-home dads, yeah! Woo! That means that one out of every family that has a parent at home, it's the father. And the mother is out driving the economic engine. So if you're going to develop this skill of a 21st century leader that is going to be able to lead in these dynamic and ever fast changing times, let's talk about what, what it's going to take to build you as a 21st century leader. So there are a few things that we need to focus on here this morning in a very short period of time. What are the attributes of a 21st century leader? And how do they compare and contrast to what you're used to in the 20th century? What are the skills that you need to develop and hone in order for you to be the kind of leader that's going to rise to the top of this organization and take advantage of these economic opportunities? How do you develop a team as a leader? What are the dynamics of team development? And then lastly, how do you measure success? Because the measurement of success for today's leader is very different than it was for the leader of yesteryear. So let's talk first off about the attributes. This is not your daddy's leadership. This is not the way that you've seen, witnessed, and probably been academically educated about what leadership means. It's a very different world in the 21st century. 20th century leadership was this. An organization, a business, was an economic entity. That's what it was, an economic entity defined by you develop structures, you set controls, you leverage capital through pyramids of hierarchies, performing rigidly narrow tasks with clear guidelines. That's how you built an organization or you built a business in the 20th century. In the 21st century, it is no longer financial capital as the main asset of the organization. It is now human capital, is the main number one asset of a business or of an organization. It is no longer economic competence. You don't need to come in with your MBA or your degree in finance to be a CEO or to run a large organization. Financial competence is not the number one intelligent factor. It is instead e emotional intelligence. It is no longer control about how you manage and run an organization. Today, it is more about how you collaborate. It is no longer about hierarchies, setting in management structures in order to run a large organization. Instead, it is leading through networks. As you can see, very different skill sets, attributes, and competencies, which is also the reason why you might recruit somebody that comes out of corporate America who is very successful, running large organizations, running large businesses, very intelligent, very capable, very skilled, and they come into this business and they fail miserably because they're bringing 20th century leadership into a very 21st century business model. 
So it is no longer aligning an organization through structures and spreadsheets. Rather, it is aligning an organization around meaning and purpose. You heard Mark talk about it here before, identifying your reason why, identifying the reason why of the people that you want to empower to be successful. And it is no longer technical or financial expertise. It is now emotional and relational aptitude. And it's no longer about developing followers. It used to be leadership is to go and develop disciples, develop followers. Today, 21st century leaders are about developing other leaders that can adapt quickly to all these dynamically changing times. Your competitive advantage, how fast you will rise to senior vice president, how fast you will become a circle of champion, is all predicated on this one factor. How fast can you grow and develop leaders. And if you can grow and develop leaders faster than the person sitting next to you, faster than anybody else in this room, you will rise to the top of this organization faster than anybody else. It's not how great you could become, it's how great of leaders you can cultivate and develop. So let me give you the game-changing mindset shift that will help you undo this 20th century leadership mindset. Here's what a leader is not to try to root out some of those previous conditionings. A leader is not a boss or a manager. See, a boss tells you what to do and everybody hates a boss. Probably one of the reasons why they've come and join you in this exciting adventure is that they hate their boss. The last thing they want you to do to them is to imagine yourself as their boss. So a leader is not a boss. Leader is not also a manager who tries to use incentives. Oh, we'll give you an iPad if you can achieve this level. You know, you do really great. You can ring the bell and we'll give you a trip to the movies. No, no. You're not a manager in this business. Managers are weenies. A leader instead models the behavior they want done. A leader does it themselves first. They'd never ask others to do what they are not willing themselves to do first. That is a very different attribute than 20th century leadership. So a leader is by example. Now this is one of the most basic principles of leadership. You've heard it a thousand times. Yet I witness that it is one of the most violated principles of all those that wish to be leaders. They ask others to do something that they have not done yet themselves. To buy something they haven't bought. To bring people to meetings that they aren't bringing people to meeting, meetings to. All these requests that they're making of others that they are not doing themselves first. So a boss and a manager prods from behind where a leader pulls from up front. Let me give you an example. So Dwight D. Eisenhower is with his generals during World War II when they were planning D-Day and the, the, the attack on Normandy and the whole bit. And he was frustrated with his, with his generals. And he was like, let me tell you how to lead. How do you lead an army? And he took out a, a, a piece of string and he says, an army, an army is like this piece of string here. He says, if you try to lead it from behind, you try to push it from behind, it will buckle up on itself and it will not advance. He said, in order to lead an army, you have to lead it from the front and pull it forward and then they will line up in unison. Same thing when it comes to leading your organization. You don't push it from behind, you lead it from up front. Leaders step out front. If you're gonna lead, you have to be first. You have to press forward into new territories, break new ground, cut the path. A boss and a manager divide and delegate responsibility, whereas a leader takes responsibility. A boss and manager says, you go, hey, you, you, you go out and do it. You know, you go out and talk to people. You go out and prospect. You go out and get people on the conference call. You go out and bring people to the meeting. A leader says, let's go. Leaders do what's scary. Leaders do what others are not. When things are, when people are scared, when they're confused, when they've lost hope, that's when leaders take the helm and carry everyone forward. Leaders set the pace. The speed of the leader is the speed of the pack. See, here's the deal. People do not go as fast as they can. They don't work as hard as they can. They don't strive to the peak of their potential. They don't go as fast as they can. 
People instead go as fast as the leader. If you want to change the dynamics of your entire organization and their production and their attitude and their aptitude, the only place in which to start trying to affect change is picking up your own pace. A boss and a manager uses fear and punishment to try to drive change in the organization, where a leader uses aspiration, servitude, and empowerment. Ross Perot put it this way, lead and inspire people. Don't try to manage and manipulate people. Inventories can be managed, but people must be led. A boss and a manager helps see people as they are. This is where you're at. Let's take an assessment. Let's do a 360, 360 review of where you're at, where a leader helps people see themselves better than they are. Brian Tracy put it this way, leadership is the ability to get extraordinary achievement from ordinary people. You're going to recruit a lot of very ordinary people into your organization who can end up becoming extraordinary leaders who could rise to the top ranks of this organization if you, the leader, see the extraordinary potential in what is seemingly an ordinary person. It is easy to be a boss and a manager. You can go to school and learn how to be a boss and a manager, but it takes real skill and character to be a leader, and you can't learn it in school. Seventy-five percent of people consider themselves in the top ten percent of leadership ability. Do you see anything wrong with that math? So people's perception, their distortion field, imagine that they're great leaders, but yet, for the most part, might not necessarily be. So let's talk about developing the right type of leadership mindset. Or put it this way, only one man in a thousand is a leader of men, and the other 9,999 follow women, according to Groucho Marx. So your personal leadership ability is the number one constraint to what you can achieve in the 21st century. If you want to take advantage of these economic times, of the wealth proliferation going on right at our feet in this moment, this is the number one skill in which to develop. And you have 100% reality. As soon as you step into the role of leadership, as soon as you enroll your first person and now you are their leader, here's the deal. Here's what you signed up for. You own 100% responsibility for the outcome of your organization. It's just like this. Like it or not, what happens when a company gets in trouble? When a large company gets in trouble, what do they want to do to try to fix it? They want to fire the CEO. What happens when a team, a professional football or basketball team, starts losing? What do they want to do? Fire the head coach, exactly. What happens when a country's not doing well? I mean, you've got the Senate and Congress, you get all these people involved in the process, but a country stops doing well, what do they want to do? They want to oust the president, because here's the deal. Leadership does own 100% responsibility. So if you're going to step into the role of leadership, know you're taking the outcome of your organization on 100%. You own it. If it's to be, it's up to you. As Napoleon Bonaparte said, there are no bad soldiers under a good general. So building a 21st century leader, here's the question I want to answer for you. How do you get the people you want to do what you want, right? Isn't that essentially what's stopping you from rising to the top ranks of, the, uh, of this organization? How do you get the people you want to then do what you want? So let me answer those two questions for you. To do that, you need to pose two questions to yourself. Here's what they are. Number one, what attributes do you want in somebody that you enroll into your organization? What kind of character, what kind of attributes? If you could build the perfect IBO, what attributes would you want them to possess? Give me a, give me a couple of examples. Motivated, persistent, discipline, integrity, committed, strong work ethic, humility. Okay, here's what I want you to do. 
I got a worksheet for you. When you text in for the slides, you'll get this worksheet as well. I want you to make a laundry list of all the things that you want in the perfect IBO. Because here's the deal. If you don't know what it is that you want, you won't know what to go out into the world looking for. So I want you to write down, just do a brain dump on a piece of paper, all the attributes you want in the perfect IBO. And then I want you to roll them up into the top 12. If you could design your perfect recruit, these are the top 12 attributes that I would want them to have. Get really clear about this. This would be one of the greatest recruiting uh, advances that you could have if you get clear about the attributes that you're looking for. That's question number one. Then question number two, and an even more question, important question is, do you have and demonstrate those very attributes? Are you committed? Are you disciplined? Do you have work ethic? Are you humble? Do, do you have integrity? Do you demonstrate passion in your everyday communications? So what you do is you take this sheet and then based on the attributes of what it is that you want, to the right, grade yourself on a scale of one to 10 of where you're at on each of those attributes. And so if you want a personal development plan, if you want to become a greater recruiter, which means one that attracts birds of a feather, then for you to attract people of those attributes, you need to become a person of those attributes. So you'll know exactly where to go to work on you so that you can be the kind of leader that you want in your own organization. So the key question for you ultimately comes down to this. If you had a chance to sign up all over again and you could pick anybody in this room to be your sponsor, anybody, of the tens of thousands of people in here, you could sign up with anybody. Would it be somebody on this front row? Would it be somebody, you know, within the crowd that you've met that you really admire? The answer to the question needs to be, would you want to be sponsored by you? Because if the answer is, well, <laughs> maybe not, then we have identified your leadership problem because nobody else wants to be either. So until you figure out what it would take for you to pick you to be sponsored by, then you will develop the kind of person necessary to attract people just of that type of quality. Jim Rohn put it this way, if you wanna be a leader who attracts quality people, the key is to become a quality person. Simple as that. John Quincy Adams, one of the forefathers of all that we've got here, said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and to become more, you are a leader. And then lastly, one of the other great leaders of history, Winston Churchill said, I no longer listen to what people say, I just watch what they do. See, behavior never lies. Don't listen to people, watch them. So what is the number one action? What I wanna do is try to boil all these things that you possibly could be doing as a leader and boil it down to the most essential, to give you something to truly just focus on when you leave and go back to your marketplace on Monday. What action do you need to take in order to rise to become a 21st century leader? So to answer this question, I'm gonna ask another great leader of our time, Mr. Art Williams. Matter of fact, was the leader of an organization that. Greg Provenzano came from before founding ACN. But Art Williams, if you're not familiar with him, was a former high school football coach. That was his qualifications to be a leader. That was his resume, high school football coach. And he ended up build, building an organization of 225,000 licensed agents in the insurance business, became the number one individual life insurance seller that was more than Number two and three combined. They sold more insurance than Prudential and New York Life combined. Built a $93.5 billion little IBO business, okay? He's gonna tell you the number one action you need to take as a 21st century leader. Let me have him tell it to you in his words. Do it and do it until the job gets done. And then they talk about how great it is to be somebody they're proud of. We need leaders in America who can do it. If you want to become somebody, do it. If you want to go and finish for yourself, 
do it. If you want to become financially independent, do it. I hear too much talk in these United States. Everybody can talk a good game. We need people in America who can do it. I go all over this country with A.O. Williams and I have people say, Art, you, you can count on me. Wonderful, just do it. Art, I guarantee you this is my last stop. I'm going to win now. Super duper, just do it. Art, if I could just have one good month and get the ball going, I know I could make it big. Super, just do it. Art, if I could just pay off this debt, I could really go. Great, just do it. Art, if I could just sell my house, do it. Uh, but houses ain't selling. Do it anyway. Uh, Art, I'm not making any money. What can I do? Y you just do it. Uh, do what, Art? You do it and do it and do it. Uh, Art, I guarantee I'm going to win this contest. Super duper, just do it. All right, I'm over the hump now. Watch my smoke. Great. Just do it. All right, I want to make it so bad I can taste it. What I do? You just do it. All right, I'm a vice president now. Can I quit doing it? No. Nope. All right, I don't know if I can keep on keeping on. I'm really hurting what I do. You just do it. Do what, Art? Right? You do it and do it and do it. All right, all my life I wanted to be somebody important. Well, what do it then? All right, I'm going to save money so I don't have to go through this again. Great. Just do it. All right, I don't feel like I've had enough training. What I do? You just do it. All right, my manager don't give me no help. What I do? You just do it. All right, you don't understand. I was Mr. Everything at my former company. You don't mean I, I have to start off down at the bottom and do it, do you? Yep, you really got to do it. All right. All right, what's the primary difference between winners and losers? The, win the winners do it. They do it and do it and do it and do it until the job gets done. And then they talk about how great it is to finally have achieved something unique and how glad they are that they didn't quit like everybody else and how wonderful it is to finally be somebody they're proud of and make a difference with their life. Thank you. So if we talked about the number one action, let's now talk about the number one quality of a leader. What is the number one quality of a 21st century leader? So we could boil it down to one thing for you to focus on. Here's what it is. Confidence. Confidence is the main ingredient to even driving economic markets. We even describe markets with the term confidence. Right? Do we have market confidence? Is there consumer confidence? So if you are a leader, the one thing that you want to be imbuing into your people at all times, demonstrating, showing, exemplifying, is steadfast confidence. A leader is one that unearths confidence out of others. To become more than they are, to illuminate the path for others to journey forward farther than they even thought possible by themselves. And so now let me give you the number one gift. The number one gift of a leader that can go around giving to those people that you are ultimately going to cultivate in your organization. If there's one thing when you're talking to somebody on the phone, when they come into your meeting, you're talking to them in the hallway, you know, you're taking them out to lunch. You're on a three-way call. If there's one gift that you can give them at every turn, this is the one gift, and that gift is hope. What people want from their leaders is hope. A hope of a better tomorrow. A hope that it's possible. A hope that they can do it. A hope that, they, that you believe in them. As a matter of fact, the leader of our country right now based his entire campaign on this single word, hope. Why? Because that's the one thing people want from their leaders, is a sense of hope that tomorrow is a better day than today. So at every turn, in every conversation, in every interaction with your people, the one thing you always want to instill is hope. Napoleon Bonaparte put it this way, a leader is a dealer of hope. That's all they do is they go around and dispense hope to all the people around them at every turn. So now let's talk about building the skills, chiseling you out of the granite so that you could become the David of a great leader amongst your community, amongst your state, amongst your country, amongst your tens of thousands of organization-wide 
Senior Vice President, Circle of Champion Organization. What are the important skills to develop? Number one is recruiting and enrolling. The number one job of any leader is to go and recruit the best people to be on your team. Because it comes down to this. Businesses are not products or inventories or transactions or P&L statements or balance sheets and bank balances. Businesses are simply people. People helping people. Inside of any blue chip company, inside of any great brand, all there is inside there are just people who have the same fears, hopes, desires, dreams, you know, are scared of, worried about the same things the rest of us are. Serving other people who have the same hopes, dreams, desires, scared and worried about the same things that we are. It is just people serving people. And it comes down to this. The best businesses in the world have the best people. Period. That's how it happens. How do you develop the best organization in the world? You go and get the best people. How do you develop the world championship team? You go and you get the best people. It starts with getting the best people. Selection is 95% of the process. Now I want to change some of your recruiting behaviors as we go through this recruiting and enrollment skill building process. Selection is 95% of the process, uh, part of the process. One great person can outperform three good people. And in this type of a business, one great person can outperform leagues of good people. You find one Art Napolitano, you find one Mark Isaacs, you find one of these great people here and they will change the dynamics of your organization forever. One great person. As Jim Collins said, the single most important thing you need to do is to pick the right people and then keep them. There's nothing more important than this in the role of leadership. Saves you, here's how to save you tons of, of, of headache and heartache. Great people are not trained. They are found. I remember I had lunch with the, uh, the chairman of, of Marriott, uh, and I stayed in one of his hotel properties, and we met down in the restaurant. And uh, when I got there for lunch, I, I, I asked him, I said, man, how, how do you train your people to be so friendly? I mean, everybody that, that I came in contact with, no matter whether it's the front desk staff or the janitorial staff, they were so friendly. He says, we don't train our people to be friendly. We just hire friendly people. And I thought, wow. You don't train yourself, your people to be disciplined. You don't train your people to be hardworking. You don't train your people to be passionate. You don't train your people to be committed. You just go out and find committed people, passionate people, disciplined people, hardworking people. That, my friends, will save you tons of headache and heartache. You can't make chicken salad out of chicken, you know, right? No, much faster way in order for you to build a dynamic organization is go out and find dynamic people. Here's what people are looking for. So if you're out there saying, what do they want? How can I attract them here so that they see a better hope for their future right here with us? Here's what people are out looking for. And it's very different than probably what it is that you're out promoting. And this comes from Brad Smarts who wrote the book Top Grading. This is what people are looking for in a professional business uh, environment. Number one, they're looking to work with great people. The reason why people are attracted to work for Apple, work for Google, work for you know, Facebook, some of these other dynamic companies because they want to go and work with other really great people. People is the number one attracting force for why somebody joins one organization over another. And the great asset that you guys have in this organization right here is you have amazing, top talented, passionate, incredible people not only at the top of your organization with the four founders and their incredible management team, I'm talking about right here in the audience. You have amazing people. And what people want to do is they want to be around other great people. That should be the number one part of your recruiting script. You could be a part of a group of people that are amazing, that are great, that are going for it, that are doing amazing things in the world. You could join us and do this great work together. 
That's number one is people. Number two is challenge. They want to do something exciting. They want to think, you know, they want to go on a journey. They want to be part of an adventure. They want to be part of a mission, something that's important. People are looking for a challenge. That's number two. Number three, they're looking for an opportunity. There are too many jobs out there where there's, there's nowhere to go. Once they join the organization, that's it. They want to know that there's an upside, that the stage is available. If they work hard enough and stay committed, they can too be here. That's number three. Number four is growth. They're looking for personal growth. Who am I going to become? As I get up and go and do this every day, do I like who I am? Who am I becoming? Do I feel like I can grow here? That's number four. And number five, this is after tens of thousands of people have been researched and studied. Number five, what they want is money. But it's fifth on the list of five things that they're looking for. So the question I ask you is, how does your recruiting script read? Is it maybe backwards? Are you going out there talking about the money that could be made here? This supplement to the part-time income? Or, you know, what great financial freedom is available here? Because if you are, you are appealing to the least interest aspect of what people are looking for. Instead, talk about the amazing people. Talk about the great challenge, the great cause, the great adventure that you have here, the great opportunity for an upside to become somebody, to stand up here and be arm in arm with the circle of champions. Rearrange your recruiting script. And this is what Steve Jobs says that he was looking for whenever he sat across the table from somebody else. He said, when I hire someone really senior, competence is the ante. In other words, look, you got to be intelligent. That's table stakes. They have to be really smart. But the real issue for me is, are they going to fall in love with Apple? Because if they fall in love with Apple, everything else will take care of itself. So when you start talking to somebody, I want you to start thinking, is this the kind of person who could fall in love with ACM? Who has the kind of DNA, the kind of personality, the kind of heart, the kind of spirit who could fall in love with what we're doing? If you don't think that that's part of the equation, stop talking to them. Because that for you should be table stakes before you invest your heart into somebody else's heart. So let me just clear up one of the things that I hear so often. It's like, what do I say if I'm out recruiting? What do I say? What's my script? What if they say this and I got this objection and how do I come back with this? And what do I lead with? I pick up the phone. What do I, what's the first thing I said? I say, let me give you the, the recruiting script of the greatest recruiter in all of human history has built the largest organization that exists today. This was his recruiting script. You, follow me. Now, I'm no genius, but that seems like a pretty crappy script, as far as I'm concerned, right? But it wasn't what he said, it was who he was. See, as Emerson put it, you wanna be the kind of person that who you are speaks so loud, people can't hear a word you say. See, I have some people in my life that if they said, you follow me in this investment, in this project, you know, to this event, I would say, absolutely, I'm in. Because they have that kind of credibility and I trust them. I, because of who they are, if they say, you follow me, I follow suit. And I have some other people in my life that if they said, you follow me, no way, no how. I don't care what the brochure said, how great the video was, how dynamic the meeting is, I am not following no way, no how, and it has nothing to do with the brochure, meeting, or video. It has everything to do with the one who was asking. This is the same thing that will show up in your own recruiting efforts. It's not what you say, it's who you are behind the words. Who you are behind the words is more powerful than the words that you speak. So let's talk about how to become more powerful in this process. Be the message you bring. You don't attract what you want. You can't go out and attract all these attributes of people that you want. You only attract who you are in reflection. 
We communicate with feelings, not words. Now when you start talking about what's the script when you talk, it's not the words that you speak, it's the feeling behind the words. So let me give you an example. Let's say that there's this house that's uh, way back up off the street and there's a long pathway that leads up to the front door uh, and then there's a fence that goes around it and you have to make a delivery and get a signature and if you don't your career is at stake you have to get this delivered and get a signature your life depends on it so you walk up to the gate and on the gate is this big sign beware of dog and you can't see over the fence now you get a little nervous so you open the gate you peer your head and it looks like the coast is clear you get about four or five steps in, and then from over the left corner of the house, you see the head of a giant Rottweiler. And you freeze, and it starts charging at you. And you go booking it for the, for the front, front gate, and it just nips your heel as you finally get your foot free from the gate. Now you're going, what am I gonna do? I've gotta get to the front door, but now there's this dog between me and the front door. Well, up comes this little girl with blonde pigtails, and she's licking a lollipop. And she goes in the same gate and goes skipping it up the walkway, and the dog is doing what? Licking her heels all the way up to the front door. Same vicious dog, very different outcome. Why? Because dogs, like humans, communicate with feelings. When you went in, you communicated fear, which meant danger, dog attacks. When the little girl went through the front gate, she communicated joy and cheer, and the dog responded accordingly by licking her heels all the way up to the front door. See, we too communicate with feelings. Have you ever been talking to somebody and you just know they're lying? I mean, everything they're saying sounds fine, but you just know they're lying, right? Because it doesn't have to do with what they're saying, it has to do with the communication of feeling that is being transferred. So we can communicate with feelings, not words. You cannot convince somebody of something you are not convinced of yourself first. You cannot sell something you have not bought wholeheartedly yourself first. Don't go out and try to sell the essential services of ACN until your house is fully hooked up with all the essential services of ACN. I mean, for crying out loud, why would you try to sell something you're not even buying? Because you will communicate that feeling. And, it, and unless you fully bought in that this is what you're doing, you're staking your claim, you're building your future on the rock of ACN, you will be senior vice president. Until you have that conviction, you will not be able to convey that conviction, that hope and promise to somebody else. So you fully first need to buy it wholeheartedly. Then you could come from the position of being able to communicate that authentically. So what is the most attractive feeling that you could cultivate up inside yourself. And I will say that it is, in fact, passion. This feeling of passion. Now, I'm not talking about exuberant, crazy enthusiasm. No, I'm talking about this confident sense of passion, this fortitude that this is what you are doing, this is who you are, this is where you're building your future, passion. So let me tell it to you how Jim Rohn taught it to me. He said, you know, words are like a little straight pin. You know those little straight pins in a, in a men's dress shirt? You know, it's, it's pinned together by all these little straight pins. You know, it's about this, this big. He says, you could take a little straight pin, and if somebody's standing about three or four feet away from you, you could throw that straight pin, and it'll bounce off their cheek, and they'll feel it, but it won't really, it won't really affect them. Those are what words are like. He said, now I could take that little straight pin, and I could wire it to an iron bar. Now I could take that straight pin and I could drive it through your heart. The iron bar is the emotion you put behind the words. When you put the proper emotion behind the words, now you can drive the message of what you're trying to communicate through someone's heart. So the words are the straight pin. The emotion is the iron bar. So let me give you some recruiting, game-changing mindset shifts here so that you could become a better recruiter in your own path forward. Turn this four-letter word of sell. 
change this word from sell to help. When I was in real estate back in the early 20s, my early 20s, not the early 20s. Did I tell you about this face cream? I remember I sat down with one of my mentors and uh, I was, we we're talking about how I was trying to build my business and trying to create more sales. And he says, well, let me see, let me see um, the, 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 the list of people that you're talking to. And so I, I brought out my prospect list and my prospect list at the top said hit list. And he says, well, I can tell you what your problem is right now. I said, what? He says, hit list? Who in the heck wants to be your next hit? If you're going down this list thinking that this is their, your next hit, you're obviously going to be pushing people away from you. Instead, cross that out and, and, and write, these are the families that I will impact next. And he said, when, before you call them, I want you to imagine that family. This family wants to buy a new home. They want to raise their family in a safe environment where there's great schools. They want to get out of this cramped environment and upgrade to a new home where they can get their children into better schools, where they can, they can, they can grow their family in a comfortable environment. I want you to think about their fears, their hopes, what they're worried about, what they're scared of, and then pick up the phone and call them and talk to them about your services. Think of how you can help people, not how you can sell people. And when you change that mindset, I'm telling you, people will be much more responsive to your message when they genuinely feel that you're trying to help them, not trying to sell them. Focus on what you can do for them versus what they can do for you, and they will do almost anything for you. When people get a genuine understanding that you're there to help them, they will open up the door to their lives wide open for you. Famously, Zig Ziglar, the great late Zig Ziglar, put it this way, you can have everything in life that you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. Instead of just hearing that as a motivational term, make it a mantra of your behavior in the marketplace. If you could just help enough other people get what they want, you don't have to worry about success. You'll get all that you want yourself. Turn this, this word of get. What can I get? What can I get from somebody else to give? What can I give to someone else? So whatever it is that you want, I want you to figure out how you can give that to somebody else. Do you want more strength? Then help somebody else find their strength. Do you want more courage? Do you feel like in order to go and talk to more people or to be a better leader, you need to bolster your courage? The best way for you to bolster your courage is to go encourage someone else. If you feel like you want more confidence, go help somebody else find their confidence. If you want more love, go give love to somebody else. If you want greater belief in yourself, help somebody else find greater belief in themselves. If you want more hope for your future, go help somebody else have hope for their future. Whatever it is that you want in life, figure out whatever your goals are, and then go figure out how you can go help, help somebody else find those things for themselves. And then turn communicate to connect. See, in this world of technology, we're communicating all the time. But that is very different than connecting. Tweeting and Facebooking and emailing, that is not connecting. That is simply just communicating. Hey, it has its purpose, but do not mistake that for connection. And you will need connection to recruit. You will need connection to lead, not communication. It requires face-to-face, heart-to-heart. The reality is it only takes about a dozen or two relationships for you to find yourself at the highest levels of our society. You can ask Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, or Oprah Winfrey. Their whole success path has probably come down to about a dozen or two very important relationships. Figure out your dozen or two very important relationships and don't communicate with them. Don't keep in touch with them on Facebook. Connect with them face-to-face, heart-to-heart. That's where human beings get it done. So now that we talked about recruiting, let's talk about sorting and upgrading people to positions of leadership. Here's one of the biggest mistakes you'll make as a leader. Let me prevent this for you right now. Some of you probably have made this mistake up to this point. Let me help prevent it going forward. Working with the unwilling. Wanting it for others more than they want it for themselves. Huge mistake. 
grandiose waste of time, energy, love, and energy and passion placed into the wrong place. Care about those that care. If you read my book, The Compound Effect, the dedication that I wrote to Jim Rohn was this one thing that he taught me, which was talk about things that matter to people who care. Don't talk about things that matter to people who don't care. And don't talk to people who care about things that don't matter. Talk, to things, talk, talk about things that matter to people who care. As Jim Rohn put it, he said, you must learn to work with those who deserve it not just those that need it. Life responds to deserve, not need. You all heard of the 80-20 rule, right? 20 people do 80% of the production. Well, in an organization like this, it ain't 80-20. It's more like 95-5. And I'm being generous. 5% do 95% of the production. So I'm telling you, you as a leader, you only work with the 5%. Oh, but how do you manage an organization of 100%? Let me give you the, the secret. By the way, I've done what, you, what you're in the business of doing. I've built an organization in a business like this to 100,000 representatives. I know what the dynamic difficulties are in trying to lead an organization like this and the pulls on your time and attention and all the people who, wanna, who want you to work with them and want to take your time and energy. So let me show you how to separate this factor. How do you do it? You work with the top 5% of your producers one-on-one, -on -one. mano y mano, face to face, heart to heart. You invest in the cultivation and the development of their, of their talent more and more and more. And then you work with the 95% in group. So if somebody's a member of the 95%, they come to you with a question, say, that's a great question. Why don't you join the conference call and we'll address that issue on the conference call. Hey, you wanna work, how do, how do you work with that? Hey, go to the Saturday training. We're gonna be talking about that thing at the Saturday training. You don't spend your precious time as a leader with the 95%. You spend your precious time with the 5%. Now, I'm not talking about 5% of society. I'm talking about the top 5% of those who are committed, those who are passionate, those that are interested, those that are doing the things necessary to become successful, those that have invested in their commitment. Jim Rohn put it this way, leaders must understand that some people will inevitably sell out to the evil side. Don't waste your time on wondering why. Spend your time discovering who. And then separate your time accordingly. Scare away the weak. Not everybody who comes in should stay. Scare away the weak. And what I mean by the weak, I'm talking about those with weak commitment, with weak discipline, with weak passion, with weak heart for what it is that you're doing here. When anybody would come in my organization, a brand new personal recruit, once they sign up, I would say, why would I want to work with you? Convince me why I want to work with you. And then I would ask them for core commitments. Here are the 10 core commitments it takes to work with me. If you don't want to commit to these 10 core commitments, I can't work with you. My time, my energy, my goals, my aspirations are way bigger than is, necessary, than, than is possible for me to work with somebody who can't at least commit to these core commitments. You should have the same standards set for yourself. By the way, that was the same standard when it was me and my first recruit, when it was me and my 100,001 person in the organization. As a leader, I suggest that you work with fewer people, deeper, and provide more training to those great leaders that you're cultivating in your organization. So let me give you what I think is the, the art of networking. And this is how you, no matter what, on a scale of one to 10, where you think you are starting, you can go out and recruit tens. Even if you're a three, on a scale of one to 10, in your leadership, in your capability, how you can go out and recruit tens. So it doesn't matter who you know, because see, we're all six degrees of separation. And that was before LinkedIn. I think now we're one or two degrees of separation from most anybody on the planet. Anybody that you wanna recruit, you can get to if you learn the art of networking. So let me show you how this works. How to convert threes into tens. So let's say you are a three. You're starting out as a three. How can you possibly attract a 10? 
as I told you, people are only going to be attracted to the like qualities. Well, how can you possibly recruit a 10 if you're a three? Here's how you do it. You go out and you're going to recruit a three, you're going to recruit a two, and then you're going to recruit a four. So all of a sudden now your time and attention is dedicated to that four. It's you, mano y mano with that four. Now what happens when a four gets started? They're going to go out and they're going to recruit a three, and then we're going to recruit a four, and hey, they might recruit a five. Now it's you and the five working mano y mano, hand in hand. Now, the five goes out and starts recruiting. They're going to recruit another five, a six. Whoa, a five could even get up to a seven. Now you're like, Eureka, seven. Now again, we're not talking about title of previous career, financial income or economics. We're talking about a seven in terms of commitment, a seven in terms of passion, a seven in terms of heart, of, who they, of, of what they want to do with this grand adventure called ACN. So now it's you and that seven. You're not relying upon the five or the four to teach the seven. You're jumping down and working hand in hand with the seven. Now the seven goes out and recruits, finds another seven, another seven, eight. Now it's you and the eight working hand in hand. The eight goes out, recruits another eight, a seven, a nine. You've got a nine on your team. You do not rely on everybody in between you to go and work with the nine. You jump down shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, and work with the nine. And now a nine will recruit another nine, another nine, ten. You now have a ten front line on that team that you work with personally. Now, it only takes two, three, four, five of these for you to become supremely successful. For you to end up having one of those fancy cars that's parked outside of the Westin. Or one of those rock star watches that I see a lot of these guys wearing here. It only takes a couple few of those tens. And again, we're talking about a ten of commitment, passion, and energy. Like Art Napolitano, I mean, these people, we're not talking about people that have the resumes of running blue chip corporations here. We're talking about people who have passion and energy and want to do great things. They're tens. You find your ten arm in arm. And it does not have to come front line. The front line is just the doorway to the rest. Go down and find your 10 and now you've got one in that team. That's how it works. Dave Ogilvy, who was one of the great advertising gurus, put it this way. If each of us recruits people who are smaller than we are, we shall become a company of dwarfs. But if each of us recruits people who are bigger than we are, we shall become a company of giants. That's how you create an extraordinary team, no matter where you think you are on the scale of one to 10. And one person, just one person, can light it up for your whole team, for your whole organization. Can make the difference. The entire speed of the group. You ever watch a cycling uh, deal where they're all in a peloton, they're all, they're all going at the same pace, and then one guy breaks out. And then the whole peloton works like a dog to try to just catch up to that person. And if you have a, a particular racer that is, is, is faster than the rest of the group, you'll find that the whole speed of the race will speed up. It's kind of like a, a, a dog pack. If you're out you know, on a snowy mountain, you need one lead dog, one strong lead dog, because the rest of the dogs will fight to just keep up. Same thing in your organization. You want to go and change the dynamics of your organization, you want to speed up your organization, go find one great recruit, throw them in the middle, let them run, and the rest of your organization will speed up just to try to keep pace. We're talking about keeping pace in attitude, keeping pace in behavior, discipline, and productivity. Now let's talk about team development. How to develop a team. Jack Welch put it this way, before you're a leader, success is all about growing yourself. When you become a leader, success is all about growing others. How do you grow others? Here's where it starts. It starts with you. So there's an old, a famous story where a, a mother took her child to go see Gandhi and said, Gandhi, will you please tell my child to stop eating sweets? It's killing him. Stop eating sweets. And Gandhi says, come back in six months. Mother's confused. Six months go back. She brings her child back in front of Gandhi says, Gandhi, will you please tell him to stop eating sweets? Gandhi says to the child, my son, stop eating sweets. And she says, well, why did it take six months for you to say that? She says, because six months ago, I was eating sweets. It starts with you. The development of leadership starts with you. 
So the last piece on this worksheet that I'm giving you is take the team that you've got, take the team that you've got and evaluate them on the scale of one to 10 with all the attributes that you want as your organization. If you want to figure out how you can help your people, don't just go on, how can I help you? I'm here, I'll be on, the, I'm available for a three-year call anytime you want. You know, when you want to talk to somebody, I'm here to help you, how can I help you? That, that's, the, that's not helpful. Figure out what they need from a development standpoint that will help them become a greater leader. Well, you've decided what the attributes that you want as part of your organization. Now rate them on a scale of one to 10 on each of those attributes. Where they are weak, you know exactly where to go to help them. Raise them to tens on all those attributes and you will build great leaders. So let me give you some development, game-changing mindset shifts for you here. Turn tell into show. Don't tell people what to do. Don't tell them how to behave or what kind of discipline or how hard to work. Show them instead. Don't tell people to have guests at the meeting. Show up with your own guests at the meeting. Don't tell people to have people on the conference call. Show up with your new people to the conference call. Do not tell people to make three-way calls. Do three-way calls. One of the best three-way calls you could do is to take your brand new recruit and then somebody else you're trying to recruit and three-way in your brand new recruit and say, hey, you just saw this. You just decided to get involved. Why did you decide to get involved? Tell this other person who's thinking about the same thing. And the greatest thing that will come out of that is your new recruit will have been trained how to do exactly what it is you want them to do by doing it yourself first. Do not tell people to be positive, to work hard. Show them how positive you are. Show them how hard you're working. Demonstrate that which you want others to do. People do what they see, not what they hear. People do not want to hear a sermon, they want to see one instead. There are too many hypocrites in society. People are tired of hearing other people tell them what to do. They want authenticity. Do what you want others to do, be what you want others to be. And you should only teach what you believe and you should not teach what you don't practice. This is one of the things that disturbs me about the personal development industry. There are a lot of people teaching people about things that they do not practice themselves. If I'm not doing any one of these attributes, I cannot stand up here and talk to you about it. I can't talk to you about your good health. I can't talk to you about your good relationships if I'm not stewarding those very same traits and attributes myself. Do not teach others what you're not practicing yourself either. Because it is monkey see, monkey do. Your actions, responses, behaviors, and attributes are always training people around you. Here's the one image that I want you to get in your head. You are always on stage. As you sit there right now, you're on stage. People are watching how closely you're paying attention. Are you on your phone? Are you taking notes? You're on stage. When you walk down that hallway, you're on stage. When you're having lunch with others, you're on stage. People are watching you. Your organization will model your behavior. So where they're looking for clues is what they see, not what you go around telling them that they need to do. Turn talk into listen. Stop talking. As a leader, stop talking and start listening. As Richard Branson said, if you are a good leader, you are a good listener. That's what he said. That was fast. Make fewer statements and ask more questions. Instead of telling, start asking. Here's how it works. You want to draw people out. Your job is to find the hopes, dreams, and desires of your people and then help them. Don't talk about your goals, your ambitions, your aspirations, what you're going to do, how you're going to do this for your family, find out what their goals and hopes are, what their dreams are. It might be very different. And if you want to find the core of their motivation, figure out what they want. And you're only going to figure that out by asking, shutting the mouth, opening the ears, and asking questions. Because the great core of their motivation lies when you discover their hopes, dreams, and promises. And whenever they're down and out, all you have to do is to remind them of just that thing. One of the great leaders passed away a year or two ago, great John Wooden. He says, I remain convinced that 
compassion, sincerely caring for your players and maintaining an active interest in their lives, concerns, and motivations is one of the most important qualities a coach or a leader can have. And when you get somebody started, let me give you another quick little tip to developing your team. When they first get started, load them up fast. Like, there's no time to just sort of sit around and think about this. You know, get yourself, you know, ready to get ready. No, no, no. Load them up fast because the speed in which they start will be the greatest indication to the pace they will take for the rest of their career. So you want to get people started really fast. And then create a culture of personal development. As Jack Wells says, the most important job you have is growing your people. Developing a culture of personal development is the ultimate competitive advantage. How do you do that? Set the pace. Integrate it into your communications. And it comes down to this again. I started with this and I want to remind you of this. Ultimate competitive advantage of your organization comes down to one single imperative. imperative. Your ability to grow and develop your leaders faster than your competition. Jim Rohn put it this way, learn to help people with more than just their jobs. Don't just help people become great in ACN. Help people become great. Help people become great fathers, become great mothers, become great neighbors, become great members of the community, and you will have them become great people in ACN. And then lastly, recognize and reward. Let me give you some game-changing mindset shifts here. Don't seek praise. Don't seek the limelight. Don't seek to give your own testimonial. Instead, heap praise. Mary Kay Ash put it this way, there's only one thing more powerful than sex and money, and that is praise and recognition. People work harder for praises than they do raises. What you appreciate, appreciates. Key point here, there's perhaps no human need more neglected in the workplace than feeling valued. If you want to give them a place where they feel something different than they've ever felt anywhere else they've ever been, help them feel valued. Feeling important is as important to food as food. The need begins at birth and never goes away. The need for significance in our work is a manifestation of our inborn hunger for meaning in our lives. Help people find their meaning in their role here. I think this is also Mary Kay Ash who said, people go around with a big giant sign that says, I need love. No matter what they're barking, no matter what they're spewing out or what objections they've got or even the anger that's coming out, all they're saying is, I need love. Forget listening to what they're saying and see the sign and figure out how you can help them feel love and everything else will change. And then don't forget to have fun. Richard Branson says one of the keys to his, his, the success of his Virgin brand is that fun is infused in everything that they do. And then lastly, let me just give you the measurement of success how to measure your success as a leader, because it's very different in the 21st century than it was in the 20th century. Back in the 20th century, it was like this. Guy signs up, new person in the organization, right? You sit down them for a little bit of a getting started training. First thing you do is you pull out this big portfolio book. You open it up and you have this big, beautiful mansion. You say, you see this big mansion on the hill here? It says it's 8,000 square feet, custom made, Italian marble throughout, millions of dollars of, of paintings on the walls. On the back 40 here is a nine hole executive golf course. Over here to the right is a, is, a, is a vineyard. He said you pull up to the circular driveway, there's a custom made fountain, and in, in, on the driveway is all these exotic cars, Rolls Royce, Ferraris, Bentleys, the rest of it. He says, here's, take a good look at this. If you come here and you work hard, and you're committed, and you work day in and day out, someday all of this will be mine. And that's, what a lot of people communicate to others when they bring them in the organization. You work really hard so that I can have success. That's not a 21st century leader. Instead, it is not about your rank advancement. I want you to reorg your goals, whatever goals you set for 2013. And instead of writing down the rank advancement that you want, I want you to translate it now. What rank advancement are you gonna help others get? put their name and the rank advancement. Instead of having a goal of how much money you want on your commission check, I want you to reorg your goals to what amount do you want to appear on your people's commission check. Instead of figuring out what title you want, figure out the titles you could help others get. Instead of figuring out 
what, how you can accomplish your dreams, your goals. Find the dreams and goals of your people and make it your goal to help them accomplish those dreams and goals. Be known for what you allocate versus accumulate. And we take this famous line of John F. Kennedy and we give it a twist. Ask not what your people could do for you, ask what you could do for your people. Old proverb says it this way, he who wishes to be great, let him find a way to serve the many. And in the end, your success is dependent ultimately on other people's success anyway. So stop investing yourself in your own, start investing yourself in others and you'll find all the success that you need. As a leader for the 21st century, consider that position a privilege. A privilege to be able to lead other people's lives, lead them to a better future. See it also as a responsibility that you take very seriously. You are influencing the future of other people's families' lives. Take it very seriously. See it as an opportunity for soulful fulfillment, for you to do great work in the lives of others. And it gives you the highest reward. Yes, you will be given many riches for building an organization of success, but the greatest reward will be the soulful fulfillment that you get for helping other people improve their lives. And the ultimate test is the grade on your check will equal the number of lives that you've influenced. Now, because I consider this a very serious topic for you to grow in, I would love to have my mentor, the one who helped me become a great leader, give you the final word on becoming a 21st century leader. To make one final solicitation of you as you walk out of this auditorium and you go back to your marketplace, you go back to your organization, I'd like Jim Rohn to give you one final appeal. We did this pro program together. I felt like Natalie Cole with her father who never got a chance to, to, to sing with her father. It was too late, he had already passed away. Well, I never got to do a program with Jim Rohn. So what we did instead is we went through all his archival library. I wrote down every question I ever wanted to know from Jim on leadership, on wealth building, on communication, on persuasion, on you know being a great leader. And I asked those questions and then we went through all of his, his lifetime of archival, archival library and then we found his answer and we created this interactive dialogue which is kind of like Natalie Cole singing with her father singing Unforgettable, we now have this Lessons of a Lifetime program that Jim and I have put together that I think is extraordinary. And as I was going through some of the archival fo uh, footage, this is one of the things that we're putting into volume three. We only have volume one out, but it was so great and it's what I would want Jim to tell you right now. So I'm gonna let him tell it to you in his words. First question is one of the major questions of the world, why? Why should you try? Why read that many books? Why go that far? Why earn that much? Why share that much? Why learn all that? Why get up that early? Why put yourself through that much? Why try for all that? Good question. Why? One of the best answers to why is the second question. Why not? What else are you going to do with your life? Why not see how many books you can read, how far you can go, how much you can earn, how many friends you can make, how much personality you can develop, influence you can have, how many things you can accomplish, how far you can go and what you can see. Why not? You got to stay here till you go. Why not? The third question is, why not you? Why not you? Some people have done the most incredible things with limited start. So as Jim asks of you, why not you? Let me give you some perspective. Only 12 people get on the cover of Success Magazine a year. Let me tell you how they started. Richard Branson started with dyslexia. Started with a student magazine rag, was a poor performer in school. Tony Hawk was actually diagnosed with severe hyperactivity as a child, was tested psychologically. Uh, Mehmet Oz was born to immigrant parents from Turkey in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Mark Cuban, was his grandparents were from Russia. He started out as a bartender and he was fired from his first job as a salesman uh, selling 
computer software, the job that he had before starting Broadcast.com. Susie Orman was born in the south side of Chicago. Her mother was a secretary, her father was a chicken farmer. Steve Jobs was born to two university students who gave him up for adoption, to parents who never went to university. General Colin Powell was born in Harlem to two immigrant parents from Jamaica who was a solid C student. Why not you? As Winnie the Pooh put it, you are braver than you believe, you are smarter than you seem, and stronger than you think. Don't be afraid to be amazing.